so the first thing I want to show you is the position of the hyoid bone. So here is the hyoid bone. Now this is the only bone that does not articulate in the body. And um, this is used for vocalization. So here we have our thoracic cage, which includes the ribs and the sternum. Now the sternum is going to articulate with many of the ribs via the costal cartilages, which are shown here. The ribs that directly connect to the sternum are considered true ribs. So these kind of have to piggyback, if you will, onto this pathway. So we consider these indirectly connecting with the sternum. Since these indirectly connect with the sternum, these are considered false ribs. So I also have some uh, ribs here, a couple of ribs that do not articulate with the sternum at all. And these are considered floating ribs. The vertebrae that are going to articulate with the ribs are the thoracic vertebrae. Here we've got our cervical vertebrae, and of course we've got our C1 or our atlas. We have our C2 or our axis. The thoracic vertebrae are going to articulate with the ribs, and they also have rather pronounced downward facing a um, spinous processes. After the point of articulation with the ribs, then we get into the lumbar region. Now coming back up, one feature of the sternum that you should know is the jugular notch. So here at the very top is the jugular notch. This portion of the sternum is called the manubrium. And you can see the manubrium is going to articulate with the clavicle bones, those are the collarbones. This is the body of the sternum, makes up the bulk here. And then this small part here of the sternum is the xiphoid process, the xiphoid process. Another thing that you might see on a practical exam is the costal cartilages and the sternum um, unarticulated. So make sure that you can distinguish the costal cartilages and sternum, including the jugular notch, the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. So our collarbones are called the clavicles, and the clavicle is going to articulate with the manubrium of the sternum. So remember, these are going to be, these are not gonna be articulated in a practical exam. All right, so it's important that you can make this transition here. That's not great, but it's not terrible. And I have nothing to point with now, but I'm dancing with a skeleton. So I'm just gonna go with it. You can see how it flattens out here. And this is the scapula right here. This is the posterior portion of the scapula. This is the spine of the scapula. Now the spine of the scapula, as it travels laterally, it's also going to flatten out. As it flattens out, we call this point the acromion process which articulates with the clavicle here. There's another process. So this is the coracoid process of the scapula. And this does not articulate with a bone. This is going to act as an attachment point for muscles. The shoulder joint is formed by this small indentation in the scapula called the glenoid fossa or the glenoid cavity. Now the glenoid cavity of the scapula is going to articulate with the head of the humerus. Okay, so let me show you what that looks like unarticulated here. So this is the anterior view of the unarticulated scapula. Here is the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity. Anteriorly, this smaller process, coracoid process turning this posteriorly. Now I can see the spine of the scapula. The spine of the scapula continues laterally. It's going to flatten out. This area where it flattens out is the acromion process. And the acromion process is going to articulate with the clavicle. This is the humerus. So this is how this would be articulated in the body. This is the coracoid process. This is the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity, which articulates with the head of the humerus. This is the head of the humerus here. And remember, if I were to turn this around, I've got the spine of the scapula here. 
which going out laterally flattens out to form the acromion process. And the acromion process articulates with the clavicle. One of the issues that people have with um, the practical exams is figuring out if they are looking at a bone in the anterior aspect or the posterior aspect. Now, one of the ways, if you were able to turn these around, is this is a, a pronounced but relatively small fossa here. Now, when I turn this around, you can see that this fossa is significantly larger. This is the posterior aspect we're looking at here. This is the head of the humerus. This is what articulates with the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity to make a shoulder joint. Now when this is laid on a table, here you can see that, see that the head of the humerus is touching the table. If the head of the humerus is touching the table, then I must be looking at the anterior aspect. If it's not touching the table and kind of just sticking up here, then this must be the posterior aspect. So here is the head of the humerus. There's a rather pronounced, you can see a little better from the side. See how pronounced this little bump is here? This is the lesser tubercle. This is the greater tubercle. The greater tubercle is much less pronounced. Okay, so I'm going to trace the... This is the greater tubercle. And this little thing here is the lesser tubercle. All right, so greater tubercle, lesser tubercle. All right, still an anterior aspect going down to the distal portion of the humerus here. Here we've got the coronoid fossa. This is the trochlea. Okay, the trochlea kind of looks like a spool of thread. This round portion here, the round portion here can really only be seen in the anterior aspect here. And the posterior aspect, you really can't see it. Capitulum actually translates as a bald head. So that's interesting. All right, now that we have that, now if I were to flip this around, so the posterior aspect is the olecranon fossa, the olecranon fossa. So what are all these things and why do we care? This is the ulna. One way to remember the ulna is it kind of makes a U shape. Now this U shape is actually going to form what we colloquially refer to as the elbow. The more proximal portion of the ulna is going to go on the posterior aspect of, of the humerus. And what this is going to do is this is going to rock, uh, rock back and forth along the trochlea. This portion of the ulna is called the trochlear notch because it articulates with the trochlea. If I were going to bend my elbow as far as I could, you'll notice there's a point at which I can no longer bring those two bones together. So here we've got the coronoid process of the ulna is going to tuck right there into the coronoid fossa of the humerus. And the portion that is right here that rocks back and forth um, across the trochlea is the trochlear notch. Now when I flip this posteriorly, looking at the back of the elbow, we get this. We have the olecranon fossa and the portion that articulates with the olecranon fossa is, is the olecranon process. So the olecranon process articulates with olecranon fossa on the humerus to prevent the elbow from bending backwards. Now there's more to our elbow than just that. Here's the radius. This funny looking thing here is actually the head. This is the head of the radius. Now the head of the radius is going to articulate with the capitulum. Now the reason that we have this, so the capitulum articulates with the head of the radius. And what's awesome about this, with the shape of this joint, some unique movements that I can't get elsewhere in the body. So this joint allows for what we call pronation and supination of the hands. For hands, um, the wrist bones collectively can be referred to as the carpals, and they're very friendly and they meet up with the meta carpals. Okay, so the metacarpals meet up with the carpals. So these are the bones in the palm of the hand. And collectively, we call the bones of the fingers and toes, we refer to them as the phalanges. Here is the elbow articulated in the skeleton. Remember, this is the ulna, right? This is the this portion of the ulna that makes up what we 
call the elbow colloquially. Um, this is actually the olecranon process of the ulna, which is going to fit into that olecranon fossa of the humerus. The trochlear notch of the ulna is going to rock back and forth on the trochlea of the humerus. Anteriorly, as I bend this more and more, this portion of the ulna is going to fit into this fossa here. This is the coronoid fossa of the humerus, and this is the coronoid process on the ulna. Now here is the radius. The radius has the radial tuberosity, which is this uh, this little bump here. That is the radial tuberosity, radial tuberosity. And this end is going to articulate with the carpals. Carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So now let's look at the pelvic girdle. The pelvic girdle is made up of the sacrum and the coccyx and your two hip bones. The hip bones are also known as ox coxa um, or pelvic bones. So the pelvic bones um, are actually formed by the fusion of three different bones. These large areas here, this is the ilium, the ilium. So there's two holes here. These are the obturator foramina, or this is an obturator foramen. This is another obturator foramen. Two foramen are foramina. That would be plural. Now the point at which these uh, bones come together, this is the pubic symphysis, the pubic symphysis. Now the pubic bone <clears throat> or the pubis is going to be this area here and here and right by where we have the pubic symphysis. Now underneath, <clears throat> inferiorly to the obturator foramen, you have the ischium. Okay, so this would be the ischium. Now when you put your hands on your hips, you're actually putting your hands on this portion here, and this is called the iliac crest. This rather large cavity here, this is the acetabellum. This articulates with the head of the femur to make the hip joint. For this reason, we get less range of motion, but we do tend to see less injuries with the hip joint than we do with the rotator cuff of the shoulder. The first thing you're gonna wanna do with the hip bone or oscoxa is to orient yourself. This is the pubic symphysis, and then I would have the other hip bone here. This is the obturator foramen. Underneath the obturator foramen, we have the ischium. The pubis would be here, okay? the pubis or the pubic bone. And this portion of the bone is the ilium. This portion of the ilium here is the iliac crest. Um, here is the acetabellum. It actually would be more like that in the body. But I'm gonna just take this way now. This is the femur. This is the head of the femur. This is the neck of the femur. This is the greater trochanter. This is the lesser trochanter. Here I've got it darkened in, so don't be worried if you're looking in the practical exam and you're like, where's the black line? Okay, we don't have a black line. This is just to kind of highlight this line. But there is a faint line here called the linea aspera. The way that you can tell whether you are posterior or anterior is to look at this huge uh, indentation here. This is very, very pronounced. This is the back of the knee. Okay, so this is the posterior. So this would then be the posterior aspect. In order for me to be able to walk around, the head of the femur has to be pointing medially. It's got to be like this. So this is medial, and this, distally, is the medial condyle. This would be the lateral condyle. This is the tibia. The tibia forms the shin. When you look at the tibia, you'll kind of notice that one side is kind of smooth, and the other side kind of comes to a point a little bit. This is the shin. Now, this is going to articulate with the femur. This is the uh, inner ankle bone that we can kind of feel. So that inner ankle bone, this is that medial malleolus. So since this is the medial malleolus, that must mean that this is the medial condyle of the tibia, which would make this the lateral condyle of the tibia. This um, 
For this, you don't need to know any special features or anything. You just need to be able to recognize in a practical exam that that is indeed a fibula. And if you say fibia, I'm not gonna give you credit. Okay, keep that in mind. So tibia, fibula. This is the foot. It's going to articulate with the tibia like so. Right, so this is the, the talus. And remember the calcaneal is the heel, right? Calcaneal is the heel. These are the tarsals, the metatarsals. And remember fingers and toes, bones of the fingers and toes are the phalanges. All right, so this is the sacrum. Here is the coccyx. The coccyx, um, it's not supposed to be broken off, but it just breaks off because you guys are rough with them, right? Sacrum, coccyx, which is the tailbone. And you can see here, maybe, that the coccyx is actually made up of about four fused bones. The easiest one to identify um, are going to be vertebrae that are in the cervical region of the spine. The reason for that is because only the cervical vertebrae have these additional holes right here. Right, so these holes right here, that's the transverse foramina. These only exist in cervical vertebrae. And then of course we have the body. We've got the spinous process. Spinous process bifurcates, splits off into two. It bifurcates in the uh, cervical vertebrae. Um, the hole in the middle is the vertebral foramen. The vertebral foramen is going to be where the spinal cord goes through. Now, what about the thoracic? Um, the thoracic vertebrae are going to articulate with ribs. Occasionally, we can see these things called uh, dimmy facets, which kind of look like little pieces of glue. Here, I don't have the foramina, but I have very pronounced transverse processes. See the difference here? And if I look at it just right, I can see three, three distinct processes, okay? Transverse, spinous process, and the other transverse. When we look to the side, we can really see uh, what makes the thoracic vertebrae spectacular. The thoracic vertebrae have a very long spinous process. In the lumbar vertebrae, not only do we see pronounced transverse processes, but we also see that the articulate processes become very pronounced. So if you look at this in the right angle, you'll see I've got three protrusions here for the thoracic vertebrae. Here, I've got five. A transverse process, an articulate process, a spinous process, another articulate process, and then a transverse process. Five distinct um, uh, processes here. Another way to distinguish these is if I turn this to the side, the spinous processes of the lumbar spine are rounded. You can really see a very, very significant difference between these three vertebrae. Be complete here. So if you get something in a practical exam that just looks like a rock, <laughs> it is, call it a rock, no. Um, that is the patella. That is the patella. Oops, wrong way. This is the patella. The patella is going to, it's a sesamoid bone, which means it is buried in a tendon. And that is just going to glide across this uh, knee joint to give it a little bit of added protection. Right? And then here we can see the um, medial condyles of the femur and the tibia articulating. And then the lateral condyles of femur and tibia articulating. All right, so here we can see the articulation of the fibula. All right, so this is the fibula here, and the medial malleolus makes that inner that inner ankle portion. The outer ankle portion is made up of the fibula. This is the calcaneal, and the ankle bone here is the talus. And then we've got our tarsals, the metatarsals, and then the phalanges. All right, everyone better get A's now. <laughs> Thank you for watching.